Perhaps some of these defences are familiar to you in relation to climate change. I'm sure we've all met people who are toughened and dismissive and who even mock those who bring to their notice the inconvenient truth of global warming. I think we've probably also met people who fall back into a porous stance. It's too late anyway, so we may as well just accept it. What will happen will happen. Or people who are adhesive, who adopt the point of view of one publication or one government spokesman and just keep repeating it. Nothing can shake their belief. They are so strongly attached to one particular formula. And each of these defences can come into operation at the level of the group or of the nation not just at the level of the individual. And, you know, I'm, I'm sure we see that in polarised situations, Israel and Palestine, for example, that these kinds of defences are in evidence and that they're an, they're an obstruction to finding a solution, to finding a way forward. These defences, of course, don't come separately. And I think the term hidebound encompasses a lot of the characteristics in, in one word. Hidebound is a, was originally a disease in cattle, which interestingly is characterised by the thickening of the skin or hide. Um, it's a state of mind characterised by clinging to old beliefs and received wisdom, intense resistance to change, extreme reliance on established habits and routines, and a kind of head in the sand attitude, not wanting to know. So I've outlined a certain sort of problem and I wanted to keep the main bit of my allocated time to the question of, of what I think might help and I think lots of things might help and I, I'm just going to talk about one of them that's, that I think is of particular interest and not always spoken about. I think there are problems with skin boundary functioning in relation to climate change. Some of you will have read the abstract where I say that climate change, the outside that we need to think about on the inside it's diffuse, it has no colour, it has no odour, it has no sound. It's um, unclear, the narrative going forward is unclear with regard to the specifics. When, where and how will the effects of warming manifest themselves? And the, the possibilities of some kind of human we, some kind of species we, is made difficult by these factors that we can't quite get a handle on climate change, we can't quite get a clear picture of it, of how things are going to be. Um, and in addition to that, it's made difficult by the great distances and numerous differences between people in one part of the world or another. So we need to look for things that reach across those differences. So what I want really want to contribute here is concerns this question. Can art and cultural artefacts, books, plays, paintings, etc., photographs, perhaps poems, uh, documentaries reach out beyond national boundaries and can they help us to envisage and think about climate change and become better able to organize ourselves in relation to it that is by representing it in the outside world can that help us have the experience of an inner space in which to think about it because of course the inside and the outside are, are inseparable from one another there are certainly some people who think that they can. Our true impressions, our persistent intuitions will, without art, be hidden from us, and we will be left with nothing but a terminology for practical ends, which we falsely call life. Actually, it's Saul Bellow quoting Proust. That's some pretty heavy hitters there. And this is, I'm interested in the interface between psychodynamic theory and narrative theory, and this is from probably the best-known narrative therapist, White and Epson, who are Australian, who said the story does not exist prior to it being recounted. It is created in the context of its telling. And I think those of us who, who are therapists and those of us who have long conversations with other people in any, in any context know this. You don't know what you're going to say before you say it. It's not all fully formed within you and then delivered. Um, it's created in the recounting of it. That which remains unstoried, they say, this is a bit like the cells that have died, is an inchoate mass. It's an inchoate mass. There's no skin around it. <coughs> so we could think of, of narrative as a sort of skin or cloth that is woven 
around something and in weaving that that cloth around it we're better able to see it we're better able to feel it we're, we're better able to know the detail of it and it feels possible for us to think about it this was Fiona Shaw who si suffered a psychotic breakdown after the birth of a child I was in fear of and she wrote a book called Out of Me I was in fear of disintegration, though I couldn't and still can't describe what I mean by that. What has been important has been the act of turning blankness and confusion into narrative coherence, however provisional. I think the provisional is important. We need to keep telling stories, don't we? Because we have new exp experiences or new information comes in. Okay, and we need to change the story or tell a different story. The story is never final and complete. I'm trying to write a book about climate change. I don't know if it will ever get finished or see the light of day. But in the co course of that, I've of course been reading a lot in the genre. Um, and I, I haven't been very impressed by what I've found. Um, I've also watched quite a few films. Some ho Hollywood stuff like The Day After Tomorrow. I don't know if any of you have seen it. Which is, you know, great entertainment if you want to see a sort of hunky American man going through floods and ice to rescue his daughter. But I don't think it actually helps us very much to have a picture in our minds of what things might be like for us. And it, and it, it was totally unrealistic, which isn't very helpful either. There are also some very, very um, wonderful books, I think. I'm a great fan of Margaret Atwood's books. I don't know if any of you know her writing. And I also thought Cormac McCarthy's book, The Road, was just excellent, and the film too. But they are focus very much on a post-apocalyptic future. That is, they don't really help us to think about the transitional time. They don't help us to think about the near future and how we will get from here to there. And I haven't found very much that does. So I'm going to be around all day, so if you've found things, <laughs> please come and tell me. Um, one thing that seemed important to me was that somewhere like Amazon, well Amazon in particular, since it's where most books are bought, should um, enable people to identify these kinds of books when they appear. And I spoke to quite a few people like about this, including my son-in-law, and I don't know if someone did something, because recently, if you search in books in Amazon and put in Cli-Fi, the titles come up. Now I'm not claiming, claiming any credit, I'm sure it's a conversation that's been in the air in many places and I was just saying to people how, about, how would one persuade Amazon to do this you know because they've got a terrible sort of image and maybe they'd like to improve their green image by introducing this category and maybe other people were having that conversation but the category is there now if you want to find these books and you search Cli-Fi as keywords you, they, they all come up you know I haven't read them all yet there may be some brilliant ones there so um, it, it's, um, it's there We've got um, a quote, the last one on this slide. We rate the great play, movie or novel on climate change, something to stir the soul, like John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath did during the US Dust Bowl era. Now, you might have a clue here, because this is by someone called Fred Pierce. It came from the new scientist. The new scientist says, you know, we scientists, we've produced lots of facts and figures. It's important to have them, but they don't change anyone. Where's the literature, <laughs> you know? So I was really surprised to find it in, in, a, in a science magazine. We might think about not just The Grapes of Wrath, but plays like Ibsen's The Doll's House. How much did that bring to consciousness the position of women in marriages and in society? You know, what was its relative influence compared, say, to Betty Friedan's work or Germaine Greer's work? And it doesn't really matter. I'm not trying to get a sort of sense of what percentage. They're both important. But, but just the power of literature, the way it, it does weave a narrative around something, it puts the skin around it, and it both puts it out there on the pages of a book or on a stage, and, and it reaches us. So we identify with the characters, but because they're not us and they're not people we know, and the things that are happening are not happening to our spouses or children or friends, we, it's far enough out there for us to be able to relate to it and think about it. It just has this, this wonderful way of 
putting putting a boundary around it, which paradoxically allows us to engage with it. This is just a summary, really. When we identify the story, the them or the it, when, we, when it's storied, we are also able to identify and story ourselves. That is, we can story ourselves in relation to what we've read, seen, heard. And all those conversations we have after we've been to the movies with people are really about that, aren't they? About, well, where does this leave me? <laughs> you know, I've seen that. What do I think about that? So seeing it out there, something happens in here and we're able to elaborate our inner world. And we could say that we're engaging in Winnicott's terms with what he called the perpetual human task of keeping inner and outer reality separate yet interrelated. 